Okay, hi there, welcome to the next in our series of short videos looking at aspects of economic growth. In a previous video, we focused on some of the short-term factors that can influence the rate of growth of a country. Let's spend a few minutes looking at longer-term influences, long-term factors driving growth. And it's quite important to make that distinction between short-run growth and long-run growth. The short-run expansion of the nation's output of goods and services is nearly always driven by cyclical or policy factors. Changes in interest rates, changes in government spending, changes in the cost of imported goods and services and so on. Whereas long-term growth is driven a little bit by demand, but mainly by a sustained increase in a country's long-run aggregate supply. So what helps to explain uh, the rapid long-term growth that uh, some countries manage to achieve? Well, long-run growth for most modern economies is fundamentally determined by the growth of labour and capital productivity. In other words, the growth of the output per person employed or the output per hour worked from labour and also the productive efficiency of capital machinery, capital inputs used in production. So a really key point to take away from this short presentation is that productivity is vital for long-term growth. However, it's not the only factor, so let's look at some others. I'll leave this slide up for a few seconds as we go through it. You might want to take a screenshot to add to your notes. So what helps to explain rapid growth? Well, crucially, uh, the first three, I think, are fundamental. These are core factors. First of all, countries need to invest sufficiently in new capital, uh, hardware, planting machinery, uh, technology and software as well. Because if you increase in investment, if you increase investment, your capital stock goes up and that, in theory, should add to a nation's productive capacity. So I would start my explanation by talking about the importance of investment spending, capital investment. Secondly, growth can come in the long term from an expanding population and crucially within that total population, a growing active labour supply. People who are willing and able and actively searching for work, for work in the labour market. And for some countries where the natural rate of population growth has slowed down with fertility falling, for example, as they move to different stages of the, the demographic transition model, many of those countries rely on a steady, often strong flow of net inward migration of labour, particularly younger, highly qualified workers, to boost their labour supply. As we mentioned in the previous slide, long-run growth, rapid growth, is nearly always associated with an increase in labour productivity, such as an increase in GDP per hour worked or GDP per person employed. There are two measures there of productivity. So I reckon factors one, two and three are your go-to points in an exam question on long-run growth. However, other factors are also important. Oftentimes, we get growth spillovers, if you like, growth benefits or growth externalities from the, the consequences of invention and innovation. Invention, the creation of something that's palpably new. Innovation, nearly always an iterative process. And we have the next generation of something, the next generation of solar panels or the next generation of smartphones. Uh, innovation, of course, is the act of making uh, new products or newer products which have commercial value. And many countries, having achieved input and efficiency-driven growth, move on to ideas-driven growth, helped by invention and innovation. The government can have a key role to play in driving long-term growth, spending on public goods such as flood defence, such as uh, the legal system, such as air traffic control systems and defence systems and so on. So public goods are important. So too merit goods, education, healthcare, housing. Those are important to sustain growth. A healthy population, a well-educated labour force, absolutely crucial. As well as other essential infrastructure, uh, including the private sector, spending on things like telecoms, transport systems, ports and other forms of logistics. Fast-growing countries also typically have a strong, uh, vibrant business startup entrepreneurship culture. That's quite important. And some countries uh, have a growth benefit from discovering and then exploiting and selling uh, natural resources. And that includes you know, countries that discover oil and gas, for example, or countries that discover other uh, valuable mineral deposits. 
So these factors, one to seven on this slide, are essentially, I think, the key factors that drive the long-term growth, the rapid growth in some countries. I'd like to follow James Hall, Reuters correspondent in Africa. Here's a good example of, of, of a growth-enhancing story. In Rwanda, in 2021, they achieved over $1.2 billion of new foreign investment from 78 countries, uh, including this uh, agro-processing uh, uh, manufacturing capability. So for many countries, foreign investment coming in can be a source of growth. But there are, of course, downsides to this. Here's another story about Kenya. Six big Chinese firms have grabbed $9 billion in the Kenyan road network. Oftentimes, smaller Kenyan firms aren't necessarily getting those big contracts to, to build the roads. Yes, the roads get built, but the size of the multiple effect from this investment might be much smaller. We have a separate video on the economics of foreign direct investment and its links to growth and development. Global investment in Africa's startup firms doubled in 2021, over $5 billion. Um, <laughs> lots of examples of startups there, including drone technology and a marijuana plant in Lesotho. But again, the point is, is, to, is to confirm that a strong entrepreneurial culture is hugely important for long-term growth. And also, I think, making the best use of what you're very good at. Mozambique, for example, is a major producer of cashew nuts. And output went up in 2021, up an impressive 12%. And rising exports, of course, add to aggregate demand and can stimulate growth through jobs, through profits and uh, much else besides. I think one of the key issues here, though, is the extent to which, for example, Mozambique uh, cashew growers and farmers are able to process and manufacture and brand their, their products. Oftentimes, countries with a high dependency on primary products uh, they miss out on later value-added stages. They grow tomatoes, they grow cashew nuts and things, uh, and, and tea and coffee. But oftentimes the price that the producers get represents a very small percentage of the final price and the value added at retail level in high-income countries. So it's really important for these countries to develop their own capacity and capability in manufacturing and processing. We mentioned innovation. Uh, there is, in fact, a national and international league table that comes out each year on the most innovative countries in the world that takes into account research and development spending, uh, the degree to which countries are able to uh, successfully win patents, the efficiency of the tertiary education, higher education, high tech density and things and other, other factors. Germany, South Korea, Singapore and Switzerland came out the top four countries in the innovation scorecard for 2020. Of course, all of these countries here are very high-income advanced nations. Israel and Finland both appear, if you look down the table, and they, although they dropped uh, their ranking in 2020, those two countries are interesting because they have some of the highest research and development um, spending levels in the world, measured as a share of GDP. So long-run growth, quick reminder if you're using the Keynesian, uh, the neoclassical model, uh, long-run growth is an outward shift of the long run aggregate supply curve from to LOS2. And that allows, actually, in many ways, that allows the economy to operate with a higher level of demand. So, for example, you can keep the price level the same uh, if you can shift out your aggregate supply curve and operate with a higher level of demand. In the long run, the ability of an economy to produce, to supply goods and services, to meet that demand, is based on the state of technology, and the availability and the quality of factor inputs. So if we can shift out that curve, that increases potential output, increases employment, and is real economic growth in the long term. So in this video, we focus on some of the key, often supply side factors that drive long term growth. In the next video, we're going to take a look at the UK and ask a question, well, why does the UK grow fairly slowly at about 2%? A year, what factors can hold back the growth of a country? Okay, thank you for joining in. Take care, stay safe, everybody. Look after yourselves and see you again sometime soon.